Hi. This way, hopefully, it will be spotlighted for you and you can see me. My name is Alice Brown, and I am the Chief of Policy and Planning at Boston Harbor Now. Welcome to April's Harbor Use Public Forum. If you want to say hello in the chat, you are welcome to use the chat. It's open. You can chat me if you need me to know something, or you can chat the whole group. Um, if you are not part of the project team, feel free to put questions in there. You can also use the raise your hand function. Um, if you go to the participant list, you'll see everyone who's here today. I've tried to label people so that you can know who's on the project team or who they represent. You're also welcome to rename yourself. So you can always click on yourself, click the word more, and you'll see rename so you can rename yourself there. Um, you're welcome to say hi, say where you're calling in from. We will be doing a couple of polls to get a sense of who's here today. If you're on a computer, all of these functions will appear when you scroll over the screen. At the bottom, you'll see a sole set of options. You'll see participants, where you can see, get a whole list of participants. You can click on the chat. You'll see a list of chats. Um, and if you'd like closed captioning, I'm not sure how it's working today, but it is it is available on my screen. Um, if you are on a mobile device, whether that's an iPad or a tablet or a smartphone, um, you might want to click on the screen and then the three little dots will appear and those three dots will give you all of those same options. So you can go into chat or see participants that way. Um, this session is being recorded. If you don't want to appear at any point in any way, uh, just keep your screen and your micro or your sorry, not your screen, your camera and your microphone off and you will never appear on the screen. Um, if you are a member of the team or you want to appear, you're welcome to chime in. We're going to do Q&A all the way at the end of the presentation today, but there will be plenty of time for Q&A. And that's the technical stuff. I'm going to turn it over now to my partner in all wonderful Harbor Walk things, Budris. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, we all woke up this morning to some very nice news from the governor and the CDC. I think there is serious light at the end of the tunnel. Um, it's been a year now of us doing these Zooms with Boston Harbor now. We'll be figuring out as the weeks go forward and hopefully things continue to open up uh, how and whether to continue doing these as well as live programs as we used to do in the past. Um, I'm Bud Riss. I'm a board member of Boston Harbor now. I also chair our planning and policy committee. If this is your first time joining uh, a Harbor Use Forum and you're not familiar with who we are and what we do, uh, we basically have a, a, a twofold mission that seeks on the one hand to ensure the islands and the waterfront are accessible and welcoming to everyone. And secondly, we have a major focus on resilience and ensuring that um, the city of Boston and its people and assets are protected through uh, resilience measures uh, all, around, all around the waterfront. We also focus on expanding ferry service, uh, bringing underserved communities out to experience the Harbor Islands We've been a long advocate for the working port, and which is why we're very interested in this project here this morning. Uh, and we review and comment on all kinds of development projects around the waterfront uh, in Boston. We're also joined here today by Alice, who you've met earlier, uh, Kathy Abbott, President and CEO of Boston Harbor Now, and Aaron Toffler, who's the Director of Policy. Uh, we convene these forums on a monthly basis. Uh, to hear from developers, public agencies, and other advocates about work taking place around the waterfront. Today, we're focusing on a project proposed for the Ray Flynn Industrial Park at 24 Dry Dock Avenue. We have a very strong team here who is going to be uh, present, making a presentation about that project. Um, in everything we do, we believe that the waterfront belongs to all of us, that by bringing together interactive conversations like this, we can help ensure a better, more thoughtful, uh, and dynamic waterfront here in, in Boston. Last month, we heard from Magdalena Ayed of the East Boston nonprofit, The Harbor Keepers, about the Vision Chelsea Creek project uh, on the other side of the harbor from where we're focusing today. Um, we're gonna continue to use uh, digital tools as we will this morning to make this feel more like an in-person meeting, uh, including using Zoom's meeting platform so we can see each other if you choose to turn on your camera and if anyone can see us who is in attendance. I'm gonna turn it over to Alice to start a quick poll just to give us an idea of who's participating this morning. And my apologize, apologies, I have to leave a little bit early, but Alice will be running the Q&A and we know she does that very capably. <clears throat> so we've got two questions for you today. The first one is just letting us know how, what your expertise is in terms of whether or not you've visited the Boston Ship Repair Area and the dry dock. Um, if people are discovering it for the first time or people know 
all about it, the poll should be in the center of your screen and you can click uh, the response that is accurate for you. I'll give it just a couple more seconds. All right, so it looks like of the people who voted so far, um, most people have gone either a lot, 39% uh, to actually like watch the ships being repaired or about 50% of people have been there a few times. Um, the remaining 12% have either been in the area but not seen it um, or have been, haven't been have been in that part of the city at all. We've got one more question. I'm gonna end that poll. So here's what that looks like. Um, and then the next question, is what is your interest in this project? As you can see, a lot of folks here from the team today, we've got a few folks in government, consulting, and mostly people from nonprofit and interested residents. Thank you to the four something else people who have joined us as well. We're really glad that you're here today. I'm gonna to end the polling. Here's what the results look like. And close, back to you, bud. You might be muted, bud. Bud, you are muted. You think I'd know that after a year of doing this, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to turn over the, uh, the uh, program now to the development team, uh, John Cronin, and you can introduce uh, the members of your 24 dry deck uh, crew. Thank you very much, everyone. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alice. Um, really delighted to be here with you guys this morning. Thank you for, for the invitation um, on the your screen that um, SGA are sharing there. You'll, you'll see um, a list of the people and the, the groups that are working on 24 Dry Dock. Um, DHK and SGA are the architectural team. Um, Ron Burton Training Village and is one of our nonprofit liaisons along with Save the Harbor, Save the Bay and also English for New Bostonians. Um, uh, we spoke earlier with um, Ricardo from Nubian Shuttle, um, Freeway Parking Company that we're really excited to, to collaborate with down here in the seaport. Um, we also have Katja from Verdant Landscape Architects, um, Bob Lieber from Cosentini is here. Uh, I believe John Polgini might be on the call. Tom Skinner from Durand and Anastas. And Bill Lyons is also here with us today. Um, so that's basically an overview of, of the team and you'll be hearing from a number of them as we go through this presentation. But uh, if we go back a couple of years, we were really excited and grateful when we learned that we had been designated by BPDA as the developer for 24 Dry Dock. But just before we get into the 24 Dry Dock project, let's just <clears throat> spend a couple of minutes on Dry Dock number three and Boston Ship Repair. One of the conditions of the RFP was that the project provide 10,000 square feet of new space for Boston Ship Repair, which operates Dry Dock number three, as you know. And as part of our process of designing 24 Dry Dock, we spent a lot of time, countless hours, familiarizing ourselves with the Dry Dock area, with the Boston Ship Repair business. And also I should add that um, Ed Snyder, CEO of Boston Ship Repair is on with us as well. And he'll be taking you through a bit about the business in a little while. And it's really a, a fascinating business and a fascinating space. Um, we began discussions with New Spring Capital, who is the private equity company that owned the shipyard. And, and they let us know about a year and a half ago that their fund was coming to a close and they would be disposing of the shipyard business. So my background is in um, structural steel, fabrication, welding, erection, and I'm also a civil structural engineer. I've worked on Deer Island on the Boston Harbor project um, for Metcalf and Eddie, <clears throat> excuse me. And <clears throat> so I really um, was very interested in, in this business and um, understood it quite, quite well, not fully. Um, it's, it's a very different business to um, a lot of regular construction models. So we started discussions with the sellers knowing that the shipyard needed some serious investment 
And it was through this due diligence that the real magnitude of the cost and commitment that it will take to sustain a ship repair facility became clear. Um, it's something that we believe that the city, that this nation needs to, to sustain. And as we got deeper into the finances of Boston Ship Repair, it became clear that closing the shipyard was a real probability. Um, we believe that losing that shipyard would be a serious blow to the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Industrial Park, the Port of Boston, and our country's defense capabilities, not to mention you know, what the effect would be on the local economy. You know, Without finding a way to revitalize the shipyard, men and the women that work there up to 200 union jobs, blue collar jobs, um, they would move on to other positions and Boston would lose this critical maritime resource and, and the skilled workforce that drives this industry. So we understood the scale of the investment that was needed and, and we made the decision to buy the ship repair business because it, it needs to be saved. As an industrial resource, it would be almost impossible to build a new dry dock today. Estimated costs of between three and $500 million for a replacement facility, if one could find a location to build it. But there's no, if there is no significant influx of capital, the current dry dock will be beyond repair. There were, I believe, five dry docks operating at one stage in Boston. Um, dry dock four right down the street from us is, you know, beyond repair, um, unfortunately, it seems. And, you know, this is the last remaining working dry dock, and it's something that we believe is a vital asset to the city of Boston and its port. So there's really extensive capital expenditure and deferred maintenance needs. The, the, the shipyard was opened in 2000, or 1919, right at the end of the First World War. And most of the facilities in there uh, date from the Second World War era. So this several generations removed from what it would be considered a state-of-the-art facility. And while it's a magnificent space and it evokes the bygone era of great ocean liners and warships, it's, it's like having an airplane maintenance facility working on today's aircrafts with 1940s equipment. So it, it just doesn't work. So the investment needs range from just the basics like repaving the entire facility, cleaning up discarded machinery, all the way down to critical infrastructure, the, the pump house, the electrical stations, the new gantry cranes, the caisson, um, rebuilding the South and East Jetty where the South Jetty collapsed into the harbor a few years back. I mean, these costs are well in excess of $100 million. So how do we coordinate saving this ship repair and how does that relate to our proposal for 24 Dry Dock? So 24 Dry Dock is, is in essence, it's, it's a pilot project created by the really innovative thinking by the folks at BPDA and EDIC to see how, how does a mixed use development directly support one of the primary water dependent industrial uses along the Boston waterfront, Boston Ship Repair. You know, for the last couple of years, we've, we've revised our plans with BPDA to make sure that 24 Dry Dock not only provides interior space for Boston Ship Repair, but also to provide financial support to address all of the pressing needs at the shipyard to keep it open. We think this type of development is an excellent model. It addresses the enormous capital needs, it's a first step, admittedly, and we've begun talking to BPA about expanding this type of development approach in the future. We also wanna make sure that 24 Dry Dock is more than just the key component to the resurgence of Boston Ship Repair. So we've been working with BPDA to exceed standards for climate resiliency and to use the project's central location in the Marine Park to improve the public realm. We partnered with local groups that you will hear from shortly to diversify South Boston Seaport by supporting these nonprofits that benefit inner city disadvantaged populations and by increasing access to the seaport. And from initially from Nubian Square, and Ricardo will speak to that a little bit, but also from other underserved populations. Uh, they lack affordable transit options right now. So I'm gonna turn it over to our team now to go through the various elements of the project. Uh, we look forward to your comments and questions and hope we can respond to any questions you might have. And now I'd like to introduce Ed Snyder, who has been CEO of Boston Ship Repair for the last 25 years. Thanks, John. Well, good morning, everyone. As John mentioned, I'm Ed Snyder, president of and CEO of Boston Ship Repair. I've been part of Boston Ship Repair since its inception close to 25 years ago. I'm proud of what we've made the yard over that time. But unfortunately, time has taken its toll on the facility and the business. 
John gave a great overview and some of what I may mention may repeat a couple of his points. As it relates to the ship repair business, there have been a lot of ups and downs over the course of our existence. As many of you know, we have had a few different owners over roughly 20 plus years. Historically, there has been lack of investment into the facility by the prior ownership group due to various factors. We were faced with the real probability of closing this facility down. As devastating as that was to contemplate for various reasons, we were heading down that path very quickly. Thankfully, after many discussions with the city, they were understanding of what we were up against and embarked on this creative opportunity to jointly develop 24 dry dock and thereby inject a much needed infusion of revenue into the dry dock facility. As John said, we have some systems that are over 100 years old and most are, and it is incredibly difficult to compete against the shipyards down south, whose labor costs are also less than half of ours. Our aging workforce, deteriorating equipment and insufficient source services and facilities cannot compete as currently constructed. This will all lead down to the death of closure, I assure you. I was hopeful that when the city put forth the RFP out for Charter 24 Dry Dock, our participation in the project would stave off the inevitable for a while. Then John Cronin and his team were designated by the city to develop this project. Over the last year, with our sense of the future looking dim, it has been replaced with one of optimism. Boston Ship Repair and the Corona Group are one team working towards the same goals. In the last five months, with Cronin having acquired BSR from out of town PE firms, every day the focus has been improving BSR's chances of survival. For example, we have started a million dollar cleanup of the facility. We're planning another million dollar expenditure to upgrade our electrical systems, hopefully in the near future. And we are now thinking about the possibility of expanding and growing versus thinking about closing our doors forever. There is much work to do and much development to make this happen. We have miles to make, we have miles to go to make BSR a substantial ship repair business that Boston can be proud of. For the first time in many years, I feel that I am part of a group now that is focused on doing what needs to be done to save this important maritime use that has been part of the fabric of Boston for centuries. We all have to work together to make this a success story though. We have over $125 million in infrastructure improvements that are required and the South Jetty may be the most important. Many years ago, Algonquin Crane had the ability to roll along the railroad tracks around Parcel M, servicing wet ferry ships and doing topside repairs. This allowed the dry dock to service more than one ship at a time. This is a necessity that needs to happen again. When BSR was established close to 25 years ago, the jetty was in such shape that it was unusable by us. Not having a pier available by a dry dock facility has been frowned upon by many ship owners, including the government, who's our biggest customer. Years after we were in the facility, another section of the pier collapsed, thus blocking the entryway into the dry dock. With great help from Congressman Lynch, federal funds were obtained to clear up some of the debris field. The entire North and South jetties are not safe and they are unusable to us currently. We estimate repair costs there to be around $40 million and our team is focused on its revitalization. Having this available would allow us to work on two ships at once and expand into other opportunities like servicing and supporting wind power installations and vessels. This could be an important part of the future of port cities like Boston, which has great water depth and unobstructive access into the facility. We need to create the opportunity or it will pass us by. In closing, I feel our new partnership has opened a new world of opportunity for BSR. John mentioned in the conversations that he's had about participating in potential ferry dock at Pier 10 and the fact that our team is involved with them, as well as other things that are going on in the park or very positive discussions. I appreciate everyone's time this morning to underscore the importance of a few entities who still work in the ever shrinking marine industrial realm as we need the support or we will not survive. Ultimately, I believe that until our recent partnership, Dry Dock 3 was gonna go the way of the other Dry Docks in Boston to a sad, unceremonious end of a once glorious and historic Boston industry. I thank you for your time this morning and I'm available at any time to discuss the matter. Together, we can make this possible. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jeff Tompkins. Thanks, Ed. Um, so uh, just to give you an overview, I'm Jeff Tompkins of SGA um, Architects, a partner at the firm. We've been working on this project for a few months now, getting ready to have presentations like this. And um, we'll talk to you a little bit about what, where we are, where we stand with the design ideas and, and how it, it could support Boston, um, Boston Harbor Now's mission. Uh, as you know, this site here, which is at the intersection of Dry Dock Avenue, Northern Avenue, and Tide Street, you can see the 
the dry dock over here that's to the east and north of, of our site. Um, as we mentioned, um, the Pier 10 uh, project is a very important aspect of this project, uh, you know, as, as it is with a number of projects in the Marine Park, and we're happy to be a party to, to that. But um, more importantly, and, and primarily, we're very excited about the idea of supporting the dry dock with this, uh, with this new building. Um, from the neighborhood perspective, you can see that um, the neighborhood is, is definitely in a transition. Uh, there is a number of buildings in the neighborhood that have been renovated like the IDB here that you can see uh, in, the, in the foreground, but there's also a number of buildings like the older building that's on the site that was part of Boston Ship Repair is like, like the other dry dock facilities has, you know, has seen better days and requires significant amount of, uh, of upgrades and really is not valuable in its current state at all to, the, to almost anybody that would wanna to try to use it. Um, so just some other views from the intersection and then a view looking west uh, down the end. The parcel here uh, outlined in this red line here is the area that we're gonna to utilize to construct the, the newer building. It's currently about 32,000 square feet of, of land. It, it, uh, it is currently the existing three-story brick building and then some parking facilities that BSR uses and then just sort of uh, uh, sidewalk and street edge uh, elements. Yeah, um, the existing entry is almost on axis with Northern Avenue off of Tide Street, which is right through here. And we're gonna continue to utilize that as access to this particular site so we can so we can facilitate um, off street loading, uh, not only for the dry dock, which it currently enjoys, but also for the building itself. From uh, for the proposed site, you can see here, we're uh, contemplating developing the west end of the site here and turning this into more of a public realm amenity as well as an amenity for the building. Upgrades to the sidewalk um, down the dry dock avenue we're working with the EDIC now. Uh, we had initially proposed to extend this sidewalk, but working with EDIC and understanding the truck traffic that comes from coastal cement, from 88 Black Falcon, and also from the cruise port terminal on, on uh, cruise port days, the, we really do need to push that back to its original location to allow for safe truck turning uh, in and around Tide Street. From a uh, use perspective, the building will occupy BSR on the first floor here. You can see in this blue area, we've got access for them on the northeast corner that would be direct access into the, into the shipyard itself. There's ramp access uh, here on that same corner. Um, from a user perspective on the upper floors, those folks would come in through the 24 dry dock entrance here, which is on drop is on Dry Dock Avenue or up one of the West End plazas. Trucking will come in through this driveway and use the, use the loading dock and through here. From a programmatic perspective, there's about uh, 10,000 square feet of space on this first floor that will be utilized for, for BSR. There's about 8,300 square feet of support. That is uh, the lunch counter, some some storage for upper areas and then all of, all of our back of house, as well as uh, bike room and bike storage, uh, restroom facilities and vertical transportation through the building. Uh, upper floors are approximately 30,000 square foot floors. Um, it's an eight story building. So we'll have eight floors of, 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 of uh, six, seven floors of this type of use with the first floor that I just presented. Uh, with a total of about 235,500 uh, square feet, and then a mechanical penthouse on, on top of that. Um, from a resiliency standpoint, we've made our first floor elevation at the 20.5 uh, Boston City base, which is four feet about four and a half feet above where we are now. Um, we're at 16.5. And then all of our critical infrastructure, we're moving up to the 21.5 um, Boston City base elevation. So our usable floor plate is four feet above the, the current grade and our 
critical infrastructure elements are, are five feet above that, above that grade. We have minimal amount of areas where we have to deploy some flood barrier systems. I'll show you in a plan in a moment. They're essentially the entries in the loading dock. Um, but, and then our interior materials will either be you know, flood damage resistant or easily replaced. From a floor plan perspective, you can see here, these are our temporary flood barriers. It would be at the, at the loading dock. It would be at this grade entry on the northeast corner that is the grade entry for um, Boston Ship Repair. And then around our accessible ramp and stair entry to the lobby. All of the other floor you can see here in white is at the 20.5 and everything in blue is at the 21.5. Additionally, we've taken um, a measure of putting our electrical switch gear on the second floor. So we're significantly above, above the uh, flood grade in those particular locations. Elements that are on um, this floor that are, we feel are critical are obviously our fire pump and water room, our telephone MDF closet, and then our uh, oil tank pedestal that is the tank for our emergency generator that would be located on the roof. Uh, a quick section through the building that shows how we've coordinated the project with not only the design flood elevations, but also the uh, FAA glide slope. Um, half of this building is in the one engine approach section for uh, Logan Airport. So it has a much lower glide slope than the rest of the neighborhood. So we were careful in coordinating with the FAA and Massport to make sure that our mechanical penthouse and anything else that's up on that roof is well below the FAA's uh, one, uh, one engine approach section of, um, of their uh, glide slope. From a design perspective, um, we're using metal panel and glazing as our, as our um, main materials. And um, we are using, um, looking at the building from the standpoint of respecting the industrial nature of the building with the with the fenestration but also in a more contemporary you know in a more contemporary way um, so not too dissimilar to some of the trabeated designs that you might see in this particular neighborhood but with a little bit more of a contemporary flair this is the uh, view that you, you would see if you were actually in the dry dock itself looking back and you can see here in this corner here would be um, Boston Ship Repair's main entrance back into the building with some, some uh, ramping uh, and some stairs and loading facilities back over and through here. From a massing perspective, uh, this view is, uh, is interesting in the sense that it shows you how we are respecting what uh, exists today in the neighborhood for height, for height and massing. And also to show you how it relates back to the major building in the neighborhood, uh, in this section of the neighborhood, which is the IDB and how it relates in a more contemporary fashion to that particular building from a fenestration and massing and, um, and design perspective. It also gives you a really good indication of how we're enhancing the public realm. Uh, IDB did a great job of, uh, of reworking the edge of dry dock and it is our intent to continue that along the facade of our building as well as the West End uh, um, amenity. From an accessibility standpoint, all of our entrances and exits are accessible. So we'll start with the main entrance here, which is off, off of Dry Dock Avenue. It's directly across from uh, the Silver Line stop. We have multiple crosswalks that allow folks to get there either on Dry Dock itself at the corner of uh, Tide and Dry Dock or at the corner of Northern and Tide. Um, people would come across those sidewalks. They would, if they were going to go into the West End lunch counter area, they would come up this ramp through here and they could enter into any one of the doors along that West End and the Northwest End. If they were going to go into the main building, they would continue down to approximately the center of the building and then go up the ramps there and enter into the lobby where we have an elevator access. Uh, if they were coming from either of the North, um, the north facade, they would either come up this ramp here or they could use any of one of these entries, go in this entry and use an internal ramp structure to get up into, into BSR. So every, every door that we have, with the exception of the loading dock, is, um, is accessible. From a landscaping perspective, you can see here where it is our intent to uh, landscape 
escape the edge of this building along the sidewalk. Um, we have to work carefully to do that, given that the sidewalk can't be increased from truck, track, truck traffic, but we feel confident we can make that work. Um, uh, we have our west entry landscape uh, element here, which is um, using the concept of a flotsam and jetsam uh, that you might see, uh, you know, in the ocean uh, as, as an idea to, uh, to, in, um, to design the space, but also to enliven it. There's a series of, of plazas that uh, come up in grade from the original sidewalk grade with a ramp section here and a stair element off to the south end and then, then stair elements off to the west end that provide significant amount of paved area that you could have seating on as well as using uh, granite for seat walls and planning and planning structures. Um, the entrance, as I'd mentioned before, from a vehicular standpoint would be off the existing driveway through here and then in into the either to the uh, BSR's dry dock facility or into the loading docks of the, of the building. Again, as we talked about here, our plant materials will be uh, either flood resistant or easily replaceable. We have uh, made accommodations for the Nubian shuttle stop, but we're still working through where the best place to to locate that. Uh, one of the things we're talking about with the EDIC is the possibility of using the Silverline um, bus pullout. Uh, it's, uh, it's oversized for that. So we think there's a possibility of using that. We, we can uh, stop on, on the edge of the building here as long as we don't idle. So we can drop off and pick up. Um, but we think it's a really um, important aspect of the project is the connection back to the back to the Nubian shuttle spot, um, stop, as well as uh, participation in the Pier 10. We do think that this will allow folks to get to this site uh, more readily than they can now. Uh, from a detail perspective, uh, you can see here the idea of the flotsam and jetsam that we're talking about uh, in the paving, but also in three dimensions, the idea of using this uh, reclaimed granite to create seat walls and planting edge structures uh, the concept of using plaza steps to create intermediate landing zones that could be large enough to uh, both plant and sit and sit at, and, and the idea of using these unit paving patterns to create interest, uh, and also to focus attention on where, in fact, the entries to the building are. You can see that these flotsam and jetsam um, design um, design elements, you know, lead you right into the building. Just as a detail, again, point out accessible ramp along this edge here, um, stair elements, uh, plaza steps off of the, the Tide Street uh, Northern Avenue connection. And then again, plaza steps off, off the Dry Dock Avenue through here. Again, just to point out this piece of the building right here is, uh, is intended to be the lunch counter that will serve not only the BSR uh, employees, but is open open to the public and then with a seating space out here onto the west end with good access, uh, light access from the south and the north. So it's a, it'll, you know, it'll be a nice usable outdoor space for the vast majority of the seasons uh, in the city of Boston. Um, aerial perspective, bird's eye view of the space. So you can start to see how the plantings and the um, plaza steps are arranged with the flotsam and jetsam pattern. Uh, to lead you into the site uh, by creating a really welcome environment, much different than it is today, where it's chain link fenced off and has, you know, a few pieces of infrastructure, you know, aged infrastructure in there, um, not very welcoming. But this, you know, as you can see, creates a nice welcoming element to the building to, you know, quite frankly, is the first facade you'll see as you approach the site, because you'll either approach from Northern Ave or you'll approach down from Dry Dock. Uh, and this, you know, this element here is the first thing that you see as you as you come into the neighborhood. Uh, again, here from a, a pedestrian level, you can see how the plaza works and how it integrates with some of the redesign that happened over at the IDB, and then how it really sets up to um, set the stage for future development within the neighborhood. I'll turn this over to. Um, to Bill Lyons, and he can talk a little bit about the traffic analysis summary that we did for the project. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> so um, 
briefly, the uh, traffic study we prepared was prepared in accordance with the BTD and BPDA um, standards for Article E. Um, we did an analysis for the existing conditions, which at the time we did the study was 2020. We also did a future no build and build for 2027 and 2020. Um, <clears throat> all volumes that we collected were adjusted in accordance with the MassDOT policy on COVID traffic volumes. So just want to give people confidence that we took into a, account the fact that uh, our traffic study was conducted during COVID times. We did uh, do counts for autos, transit, pedestrians, and bicycles. So it was a very comprehensive review of all the mobility needs. Uh, we studied five intersections and none of the air study area intersections were gonna experience any significant degradation in the quality of travel uh, as a result of the project. Slide. Um, so uh, in terms of transportation demand management, i.e. reducing the amount of single occupant vehicles coming to the site, our uh, prize uh, uh, measure is the proposed impl um, implementation of the Nubian shuttle, which Ricardo will talk about uh, next. Uh, however, we are doing a pretty aggressive transportation demand management plan, including public transportation information, uh, providing information regarding uh, bicycles and providing storage for bicycles and long-term and short-term bicycle parking. So we believe that uh, we've done a very good job taking into account uh, the reduction of future traffic volumes. With that, next slide. And I'll pass it to Ricardo now. Ricardo. Thank you, Will. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Ricardo Lewis and I'm the owner of Prebay Parking. We are a Roxbury based parking and transportation solution company. Um, we're excited about the Nubian Square Shuttle and partnering with the Cronin Group. We're also um, in talks with uh, Mass Convention Center Authority as well. They'll have involvement uh, regarding the shuttle as well. Um, fun fact, I just wanna mention a number that sticks out is 3.5. 3.5 represents the miles between Nubian Square and 24 Drive Out. Now, I'd just like to talk a little bit about what that travel means coming from Nubian Square. If you have a job opportunity or seeking access to working in Seaport, Coming from Roxbury, it can take you anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes if you're relying on public transportation, which most people do. Um, a lot of people are not driving into Seaport. Obviously, uh, parking is uh, very scarce. And so majority of people that are coming from these neighborhoods rely on public transportation. So one way you're looking anywhere between an hour and 15 to about maybe up to two hours, just one way, depending on the time of day that you're traveling to work. Another fun fact I'd like to mention is $8 compared to $247,000. $8 represents the net medium income for families here in Roxbury. $247,000 represents the medium income for families in Seaport. These numbers are very alarming. Um, I believe with this shuttle service, it's, it's a start to change and also to improvement. Um, I always mention to the Cronin Group that I believe this shuttle service is a start to bridging that gap and also for people within this neighborhood to really seek job opportunities. Um, we're really excited about this. Um, I think it'll be a great benefit for both parties, especially with the connectivity between Lower Roxbury and Seaport. And we're looking forward to starting and getting off the ground. Thank, Thank you. you Michael Knevy. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, we are very excited about working with Ricardo in the uh, uh, getting the Nubian shuttle uh, up and running. So we also have uh, some nonprofits that will be siting in this building, and they're with us today. And again, honored for to have them as partners. We'll start off with Paul Burton from the Ron Burton Training Village. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to all. Um, I'm so honored and privileged to be here. I'm blessed to be here. This is an incredible project. Like uh, they mentioned, I am Paul Burton and I am uh, vice president of Ron Burton Training Village. Uh, this is a program that my father started. He was the number one draft pick of the then, for those who are old enough to know, the then Boston Patriots back in 1960. But he established a, a foundation called Ron Burton Training Village. 
Back in 1985, we've been around for the past 36 years. Our mission is to enrich and deeply impact the lives of challenged youth, focusing on the kids in Boston in the areas of dynamic character and leadership development, social and educational advancement, physical wellness, and spiritual growth. Our mission, our vision is to develop the entire child. We've been doing this for the past 36 years. Our three main programs consist of the purpose and leadership journey, the STEM journey, and our partnership with the Boston Red Sox called the Children, Children's Retreats. Now, John Cronin has played a critical role and an instrumental role in the success of our program. He is a member of our executive advisory board, which is being chaired by Bob Reynolds of Putnam Investments. John has visited our campus, which is located in Hubbardston, Massachusetts, about an hour outside of Boston. And he's been heavily invested in the success of our program and the children that we serve. He's spoken to him on a number of occasions. Our four core, core values are love, peace, patience, and humility. John Cronin and his crew and his team literally exemplify these four values, to, not only from a business point of view, but more importantly, from a philanthropic corporate responsibility point of view. When I think of this project, I get so excited because of the opportunity and exposure it will provide for the 500 children we serve. Our goal is to go from 500 actually to 1,000. And this project, this will, 21, 21 Dry Drop will help us achieve this goal. Though we're located in Hubberston, the kids stay with us and live with us during the summer. But throughout the rest of the eight months, since we're a year long program, we really do not have a home base in the Boston area. Uh, we focus on science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM aviation, leadership training, our Prep for Success uh, program, which focuses on ACT, ACT training for all of our students. Uh, we work with Boston Public Schools, and most of the kids come from the Boston area, but we also get kids from Brockton, Lowell, Lawrence, uh, so they would be coming into the city as well. This facility would be, would be, we'd be able to operate out of and really become our new home base for our children, and they would be so proud uh, to be part of this. We'd be offering STEM classes, aviation classes. We help some of our admissions, our monthly leadership seminars would be held in this facility. So many of our kids, they live in the Boston area, but they're not exposed to the incredible infrastructures and businesses that are out there. Through RBTV, we expose them to these amazing companies through our partnerships with like John Hancock, Deloitte, Putnam, Reebok, PwC, Suffolk, these kids visit these places and they're forever changed. Through this 21 Drive Drive program, our kids will feel that way and they'll be so proud of because this will be a place that they can come to on a weekly and monthly basis. At RBTV, we have a philosophy. When kids see beautiful things, they begin to think beautiful thoughts. This design of this building, the infrastructure, the landscape is a beautiful, beautiful project that will transform our kids and will give them opportunity provide wisdom, and they would take this and run with it. So I just want to thank John Crow and his group and for you guys for listening. Uh, we're, we're so proud of to be a part and affiliated with this, and we're humbled that you guys even asked us to be a part of this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, and thanks to you and your family for uh, carrying on a, a commitment to helping young folks in the, in, uh, the city and beyond for a really long time. Next up is Bruce Berman and Chris Mancini from Save the Harbor, Save the Bay. Thanks, Michael. Um, you know, just uh, on a personal note, I'm probably one of the few people that's ever been on the bottom deck of the dry dock with a ship in it uh, 35 years ago, watching kids from Southie grab lobsters and uh, striped bass um, after, the, after the, 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 the site had been drained. Um, I know that's been a tradition. I don't think we need to continue it. It's been a tradition at least uh, since George Regan was a kid, because I understand he once won a free fishing rod with a fish that he picked up at the bottom of the dry dock um, and entered into a contest when he was about eight years old. He tells me that's why he loves the harbor. Um, I just want to say that if you believe, look, it's a pleasure to work with this project team. Um, they, they have a, a desire to leverage uh, the investments that they're making in mixed use development um, into, in a way that really um, meets community needs. Um, at the St. Regis, uh, the way that they handled the linkage money um, to create uh, one bedroom apartments for seniors subsidized, that they could then move with the help of the neighborhood house and others, seniors that were in three bedroom apartments that were underutilized into really leverage that dollars in the same way. Um, they've done things here that, that government's been unable to do. If you believe that we need to 
really connect communities of color and need to the jobs and opportunity in the seaport. You got to love this project. Uh, the Nubian shuttle and, uh, and, 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 you know, with the exception of the South Bay Harbor Trail is, is, is really the first investment in transportation that I think, you know, um, is, is based on equity, uh, and inclusion and diversity. And we should be very proud of it. And if you believe like, look, I'm a boater like Bud, Bud is. I mean, and, and we know what happens when on the recreational side, travel lifts disappear. They never get replaced. And that means that the infrastructure that you need for the recreational economy disappears. I won't be using the, 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 the dry dock. My, my, my boat's only 41 feet. But, um, but, but the dry dock and, and, and the shipyard are the heart and soul of the marine industrial economy. And, and the way that Cronin's team has found to strengthen and make that a part of our future is unbelievable. Uh, we love the project. Uh, Chris, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about our, our program on, on the site. Thanks, uh, Michael and Bruce. I'm Chris Mancini. I'm the executive director of Save the Harbor, Save the Bay. And you know, our mission is to restore and protect Boston Harbor and, and share it with everyone to enjoy. And so, you know, a project like this that, you know, connects people to work opportunities, to training opportunities um, in the seaport, also connects people to recreational and social opportunities. And so we're really looking forward to um, working with the, the site partners and the project partners to make this site really welcoming and accessible and useful like we've done with um, in the past with the pop-up museum um, in the north end on Causeway Street. And um, it just, it's just really, uh, Paul, I really want to steal your, your, your philosophy. I love that, you know, when you show kids beautiful things, they, they have beautiful thoughts, you know, it's, it's, it's such a perfect way to put it. It's how we feel about the Harbor um, itself. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're really excited about the, the opportunity for this, this space that's investing in the, the working port, um, in, the, in the marine industry, um, and in the people of Boston, people of color, um, and uh, people from inland communities that can now get um, into this, this area, connect to the harbor, um, and also excited about the future and what all of this kind of investment represents, the potential it represents. Um, you know, connecting people by the by the shuttle um, again to the training and workforce opportunities, but also to the the recreational, the beauty, and the um, spectacular urban natural resources we have um, on Boston Harbor. Thank you, Chris and Bruce. We appreciate that, and I'll tell a story that I tell regularly. So, uh, say the harbor gets fifteen thousand uh, young folks and their families out on the water each year. Um, people that live in this city who not only have never been on the water a lot of them, but have never seen the water and they get them out. And our office is, is between where the kids get dropped off and rally and where they walk to to get on the ferries. And in the summer, other than the last year, of course, uh, I have these you know moments in the morning when there's little bubbles of joy wafting up from the sidewalk as the kids walk down uh, Northern Ave, hand in hand, uh, going on this great adventure provided them by the access given by Save the Harbor. So we're very, very lucky to have you all as, as a partner. And Listen, finally, uh, Franklin Peralta from English for New Bostonians. Thank you so much, um, Michael, and thank you to the organizers of this event for having us and giving this opportunity to us. Um, I work for an organization called English for New Bostonians. We've been around for 20 years, and our mission is to help adult immigrants to improve their English language skills as a way to get connected to better jobs and to get better integrated in, in, the, in the Boston, uh, in the city and the, and the society around. Um, I have to say, we, we support every year through our community ESOL classes, we support around a thousand uh, adults to improve their English language skills from all levels, from people that cannot say hi to people that are very fluent orally, they just need help with their reading and writing in order to get back to their professions and that kind of thing. And, and this is very important work because I don't know if you know this, this data, but 29% uh, of the resident of Boston were born in another country. And when we calculate the, the workforce, 35% of the workers in the city of Boston are immigrants. 
And we know that at least half of them come for countries where English is not the primary language and they need, they need these English classes in order to um, being able to sustain their families uh, access to good jobs. So we, besides the English, the English classes through the community, we also work with companies that are smart enough to invest in the English language skills of their employees. And the, the Cronin Group, specifically their, their Rebel Restaurant uh, unit is one of our best business partners. I'm, I'm talking about the Tony C's, the Temescal, that they have in the seaport and, and other areas in the greater Boston and the, the region. And I can tell you that when, when the pandemic hit and the, uh, we went into the lockdown, we were working with five companies teaching English to their employees. All but one company had to stop the training and that company is Rebel Restaurants. They manage uh, to continue the classes for the restaurant employees we moved from face-to-face -face classes to online classes. Um, and they saw this as an opportunity to even add some hours to those restaurant workers that because we went into the lockdown and the slow recovery after that, adding some hours because they get paid to come to the English classes. They come to uh, twice a week for two hours to study the English that they need to uh, grow and take the next uh, opportunity, the next job in, with, a, with a restaurant. We are very grateful um, to, to the Cronin Group and Rebel Restaurant for this opportunity. We just graduated the group yesterday and they all had, the, the, the students, the employees had great, great uh, remarks for the company because they see it as an investment. They know that they will be able to move from server to host. Um, they will be able to grow with the company. And finally, uh, about this, this new project, we are just delighted. Um, as I was telling Michael, um, these English classes for adults, many of them happens in dark basements in churches or community centers. So when, when um, the Cronin Group approach us and with the opportunity to have dedicated training space in this new state-of-the-art building, I was like, Wow, this is incredible! People will be will be able to see uh, that this there is an investment on them. And finally, the shuttle bus, uh, Ricardo. I was talking even with other companies, and they are like, "Yeah, part of why we cannot get uh, the workers that we need is because of the lack of transportation, and it's so hard for people to get in and out of the seaport." I don't know if you plan to run this 24 seven, but I can tell you they will be, uh, they will be people 24 seven to, to take this, this opportunity. So I see it all coming together. We'll be able to offer good jobs for people in the seaport and they will have the training that they need right there instead of having to jump from, from one work to home to the, to the English classes, everything is gonna be there in and out through the, through the shuttle. So thank you so much. We are delighted with, uh, with this opportunity. Great. Thank you, Frank. And every time we get together and talk about it, I get more, more excited about um, the opportunity to all work together. So uh, one thing that Franklin said uh, right now, we, we've known that English Bostonians uh, for New Bostonians is a great thing. So in our restaurants, uh, we have uh, definitely been working with them for a while. We just started a new venture, so to speak, with them. And so we are going to post our job openings through Franklin and his organization for the folks that might be involved or have graduated from uh, classes, English language learners, et cetera. So we're, we're excited about that. In the new space, uh, it won't be just for us. It will be for any anybody who wants to uh, take uh, Eng any English language learner that wants to take us up uh, on those things uh, within the new space. And we appreciate it. So two years ago, when we were contemplating this RFP, uh, you know, we sat at a table with John Cronin and we thought through the elements. So this is the brick and mortar. And there's the other pieces and the other pieces, the space between us uh, is as important to us or more important than any of the other pieces. And I feel like as evidenced by the folks that just spoke, like we are uh, well positioned to uh, fill the space between us. Uh, so thank you all for that. And I'll turn it over to Donna Camillo on some uh, regulatory update. Thank you.
Thanks, Michael. Um, I just wanted to provide an overview of where we are right now in the regulatory process. Um, on March 12th, we filed our project notification form. Um, prior to that, we had several pre-filing meetings with the BPDA and various agencies throughout the city. Uh, we received a lot of really good feedback, both on you know, approach to design, um, our approach to resiliency, which I think you've seen that we've incorporated a lot of those comments into um, the building that was presented. Uh, we've had our first IAG meeting, and last night we had our public meeting on the PNF. Um, the comment period is open until May 7th on the PNF. Um, and we're going to continue to work with um, BPDA and the various agencies as we're going through the process. Uh, the project is subject to MEPA, um, and it will be included in the Marine Industrial Park Master Plan update. Um, so that will be our MEPA process. And, um, and uh, additionally, will be subject to the updated Chapter 91 uh, license, the master license that will be issued for uh, the Marine Industrial Park. So that's just a summary of where we are on our regulatory process. And um, Alice, I think we're happy to take any questions um, from the group. And thank you. Thank you the whole team for, can everyone hear me? I think we're good. Um, thank you, Donna and everyone. Um, I'm gonna go back to trying to show more folks. Jeff, maybe you wanna take your screen down and then it looks more dialogue-y for people and we can pull things up if we need to. Awesome. Um, thank you everyone for joining and all of our presenters. Um, I'm happy to take questions. You can either um, go through, you can add something in the chat if you wanna ask a question. You can ping me if you want to ask a question. I will start that, um, it looks like Sarah had a question about the training and workforce development spaces that will be used by nonprofit partners. Jeff, maybe you wanna share just that slide again. And if you could tell us a little bit more about the design of that space. While you're pulling it up, I will note for those of you, I think most people on this call are pretty familiar with different kinds of waterfront development. There's lots of times when it's really vague and open. It's like, we will put a space here and maybe someone will use it. Um, and I really appreciate and commend you guys for finding the partners up front and designing a space that already works for them so that they're not retrofitting a building or you know, installing something under a pool on a second floor to make it work for them, but you have the nonprofit partners at the table up front. And I really, I really commend that. So Jeff, if you could share um, just that image and sort of talk through what's planned. So um, we haven't, uh, so the first floor space has BSR space on it, and then we have the lunch counter space. We haven't selected an exact space for those locations, but they would end up on a floor that would be like this. You know, this is a, an upper level floor. Um, we would uh, work them into the program of the square footage. So to your point, Alice, it's not like we're trying to fit these spaces into the backside of a warehouse or, you know, this is class A, you know, office life science space up here with, you know, high floor to ceilings, and unbelievable views and windows and such. So it's not, you know, again, it's class A space. It just hasn't been located within, you know, floors two through eight, but it'll be on one of those floors. Yeah, Alice, if I could just add, um... We, our, our goal primarily is to have research and development lab space on the upper floors. And mm -hmm. as such, the first six floors are probably mostly lab use. So our initial thought is to use the top floor, the penthouse floor for the 4,000 square feet of designated space. And the goal would be to build out that space completely. We're not asking any of the nonprofits to assist with tenant improvement allowances or anything like that. We're, we're gonna build out the space and it's going to be flexible space, so it can be broken up into multiple classrooms. It can be opened up into one large gathering hall. If, for example, Paul Burton needs, you know, a group meeting for a couple of hundred kids. Um, so it'll be dividable with um, movable doors and partitions, but it will be 4,000 dedicated square feet on the, on the penthouse on the top floor. So for, for everybody, 4,000 square feet is about this you know, this area in here, you know, on a, you know, in a, in a bit in the building, it could, you know, it could end up being in any configuration as John had mentioned, but it'll be flexible. It'll be accessible through the elevators. And given the fact that it'll be on the eighth floor, it'll have an unbelievable view no matter where it is. And might I add that when we, when we 
we come together as a group, not only are we bring in the kids, but we're bringing their parents, we're bringing families. So the kids hear the same message, the parents hear the same message that the kids are getting, whether that be about finance, whether that be about leadership and character, whether it be about job opportunities, whether that be about internships, our monthly gatherings uh, through our guest speakers, John has been one of them. We've had incredible dynamic speakers come and speak. In fact, we did one virtually yesterday with the chairman of Bose, Bob Maresco, who's also on our board. These monthly gatherings change kids' lives. They give them opportunity and exposure that would just blow their minds. I just want to add that in, but the parents are also involved and they get to see it too. They get to see what their kids are being a part of and that changes uh, the families uh, as well. I, I would also just sort of quickly add, uh, add to that, uh, Paul, is that no matter where this ends up on a floor, you know, if it were to end up in the West End, or uh, you'd even have this, this little section of quarter here, which is common area, where you could take a group of kids out here, or even a group of parents and stand out here and look into the dry dock. I don't know if anybody has ever seen what goes on in the dry dock when a ship is in port, but I worked in the Autodesk facility for two years when we were designing that makerspace. And um, I was just, I would just stand there outside the fence, you know, for, you know, 15, 20 minutes and just watch. It is amazing. It's an amazing, it's just mind boggling, you know, how this, this, this sheer enormity of this and just sort of the logistics that have to happen to make that work, uh, you know, will be an, uh, which just could be an unbelievable benefit to a STEM program. Would you guys be able to create an open space for the general public to go up there and watch the dry dock facilities? Independence Wharf has a lookout that is provides a really amazing view of the seaport and four point channel. Um, we hadn't considered that, Alice, to be honest with you. Um, it hadn't come up in any of our design meetings and scoping sessions with BPDA. Um, I think when it's a lab building, it could be somewhat challenging because of the Obviously, a lot of labs concerns. are very cautious about what they share and, what, and what, who gets into the building and whatnot, but let, it, let us take a look at it. Yeah, it looks like Tim had a similar idea. Timothy, sorry. <laughs> Ask, will there be elevated public viewing areas of ship repair, any number of other ways to experience this, whether it's video screens, love to see the area coming alive and being saved. Yeah, one of the other things that we have talked with some prospective lab tenants about is that they would like to create gallery space on the ground floor to kind of highlight what they're doing, whether it's with video screens or classrooms, or a lot of them are involved in STEM and teaching and public schools as well. And depending on the tenant, the layout down here might change a little bit. It might be more of a kind of a, not a museum piece, but um, kind of a, a display case for the tenant. And we would be able to incorporate Boston Ship Repair into a space like that as well. That sounds great. And actually, as a segue to one of the other questions I wrote down, which um, I heard last night, I think from Katya, that the little tree plantings shown here along Dry Dock Ave aren't going to be possible. Um, but in the elevation diagram, it also looks like there's sort of like a four foot wall that you're experiencing as you walk along Dry Dock Ave. So that might not be a phenomenal pedestrian experience. I didn't know if you guys had started thinking with that new news, if you were going to add any like decorative elements to the building or think about screens or art or interpretation along that four foot wall, given that you won't have the nice trees on the other side. So um, Alice, do you mean along the facade here? along dry Yeah, dock? I think there's like a, a strip of just building material. Um, it's yeah, it's all, it's actually, it's all glass. Yeah, there's four foot. Even along the bottom? Change. Yeah, there's a four foot elevation change, but you know, to John's point, there's this, this space here that we've kind of carved off to allow for, you know, uh, a potential life science tenant to come in here and, and do some display type things. There's also the possibility along this edge here for, you know, displaying things that are happening with BSR in the, in the windows and such, almost as if it were gallery space. And then, you know, there is this area here that opens up, which could, you know, this might be an opportunity uh, to allow, um, you know, an opening in, in whatever the fencing will, the safety fencing that would be in here to look directly into the dry dock, you know, along this edge here. So there, I do think there are some opportunities that we could look at. To, and then uh, to nerd fact that I know, but not sure if other people do, there's a cool ramp structure here that I'm drawing on your screen to show. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if you guys are preserving that or upgrading that. That's also a place for people who haven't been to this area 
you can go there now and look out over the dry dock. So that's the that's the that's the park. That's a Tide Street Park, and that's a public park. And um, it's you know we we don't um, we don't have the ability to change that, um, and we support its existence. You know, in 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 the way that it works now. And so we do support keeping it as it works. Great. Um, I have a question here from Kathy. She appreciates the comprehensive approach to the project in addressing a whole range of critical issues. Um, she asks though, will the Nubian shuttle have multiple stops or is it simply point to point? Yeah, so Kathy, we're working on that right now. We're working with the convention center um, as far as setting up the structure, the, the, the stopping points, the routes exactly, the frequencies. We've done an initial planning study and you know we built that into our budget. Um, and it also depends a little bit on um, who else wants to get involved in this. We've been approached by a couple of other tenants in the park here, big, big tenants that do some internships with kids from, um, you know, inner city neighborhoods. And they want to partner with us as well to increase the frequency so it can service their buildings as well. So it's still really a work in progress, but uh, we're delighted to, you know, discuss routes and discuss stops. And I would imagine that there will be multiple stops that won't just be point to point. Um, that we can, you know, service a couple of other neighborhoods. And, you know, with Ricardo, the goal is obviously to look at not just Nubian Square, but other communities and other neighborhoods that will need this connectivity as well and really roll it out as we, as we get going. And we have had conversations with Ricardo. Maybe you can speak to it, Ricardo, around some of the conversations you've had with the Nubian Square about, you know, potentially supporting the Main Streets district there and the shops, et cetera. Um, yeah, I can speak about it a little bit. Um, like John and Michael has mentioned, uh, I believe there is an opportunity for both neighborhoods to um, benefit. And with that being said, we are looking for local businesses and Nubian Square to participate. Um, we talked about maybe doing some advertising on the shuttles um, to gain some uh, attraction awareness in the square as well. You know, we don't want it just to be one sided workers going into Seaport. We'd like to bring Seaport into Nubian Square. So that's an open discussion that we're looking to explore and we're talking to other local businesses in Nubian Square. So uh, we, we have begun that conversation and we're trying to map it out now. And Ricardo, Ricardo had a really good idea around, you know, what if some uh, people came to Nubian Square and parked there, There's a, he's part of a development there that is getting you know, built out soon. And then, you know, grab the coffee, you know, supported the local shops there and then jumped on the shuttle. So we kind of do two things at once. And it, it's definitely our collective goal to try to get folks from the seaport to go to Newman Square, part of the city, and explore the area and support the shops there. Yeah, like Michael mentioned, um, over in the Blair lot, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, they're proposing uh, a public garage over in the Blair lot. So I'm also a part of that. A project as well. And there's obviously a connectivity to both um, projects. And, you know, where, like I said, I mentioned to the Cone Group, maybe there's an opportunity where their workers can park over in Nubian Square. And that brings people to that square. And obviously, when you're parked at that square, you have more exposure on going into shops, maybe exploring certain restaurants. And we're just trying to, like I said, benefit on both neighborhoods. Um, someone asks, Sarah asks, if the design building across the street has a shuttle and where that shuttle goes. Uh, I mean, I uh, just from working in that for two years, I know that there's there's a shuttle called the Cricket that drives around. Um, I don't. It's supported by a few folks, but it basically just goes from North Station, South Station, back to the IDB, and then back to like one Marina Park Drive and some other places. But it really just circulates, you know, in the transportation hubs. It's not it's not the offering that that Ricardo was talking about. But it does make connections to North Station and South Station. Correct. And I just want to underscore, though, that it was very important to us to have a direct connection between uh, Nubian Square and the seaport, uh, overseen by Ricardo, and the, the vehicle be the Nubian shuttle. Yeah. Uh, Alice, this is Bruce Berman. Um, yes, Bruce. Just, just, just one one other observation. You know, um, uh, as Chris mentioned, our uh, all access Boston Harbor and share the harbor program. You know, brings fifteen thousand kids, uh, uh, largely by small van and and, and bus, uh, to the harbor uh, over a hundred day period in the summer. And and our harbor explorers program serves about thirty thousand more. Um, 
when we have to cancel on that one out of every three days in the summer that it rains, uh, it sometimes leaves some of the smaller groups um, with, with transportation in place and no place to go. Um, and so one of the things that, that we hope is that, um, that there'll be an opportunity to use some of the interior space for a seasonal uh, rainy day activity um, with STEM and, um, and, and in partnership with the other site partners um, with a program that lets people um, learn about the harbor, the cleanup, and, and frankly, uh, opportunities in the uh, maritime economy, because uh, uh, that's uh, an important part of our future. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I've got a whole list of questions, but I want to make sure other people um, have an opportunity to jump in. I will keep going as people think of more questions. Um, in the transportation world, you guys mentioned a relationship with Pier 10 and future ferry service there. I know multiple people have talked to us about that, including the 88 Black Falcon folks. Do you guys have an official commitment or official interest, or you're just like, we're in support, this is a good idea? Uh, we are absolutely in support. I think it's a fantastic idea and we have committed uh, funds already to support that study. Um, I think we're one of the five groups that are contributing to that study. So we're delighted to be part of it. Great. Um, and then I had a question that is either for Jeff or for um, Ed. You had an image of a bunch of industrial maker space that looked really cool. I didn't know if that was a precedent from somewhere that you're hoping to recreate or just sort of inspirational ideas or if that's what similar to what's gonna go in on the ground floor. Yeah, that space. Well, two, uh, three of these images are the space that I designed for Autodesk in IDB. And it is the, and then these, these other shop images are more uh, inspirational images that come from different spaces that are similar to uh, the IDB. Um, I, I, per I personally have an expertise in these kinds of spaces. I, I design industrial maker spaces for our firm all over the country. And, um, and which is part of the reason why I'm involved in this project to try to make sure that as the project evolves and as more, uh, as the pilot program expands, as John mentioned, that spaces that are adjacent to the dry dock uh, will accommodate their modern uses. So we will have spaces like this in future phases of this of, of this project and adjacent projects. Um, it's imperative that that you know, as Ed had mentioned, it's imperative that these these uh, manufacturing uh, concepts catch up with the with the with BSR's functions. Uh, a lot of this stuff, a lot of what needs to happen on the interior of ships can be built in sections uh, by robotics with, with, you know, welding shops, with carpentry shops, with electrical harnessing shops, all of those things can, um, can facilitate, uh, you know, moving a ship in and out of the dry dock much quicker than you could do if you're doing that all outside or if you're doing that in old quonsets or in, you know, trying to work inside of a container that's been turned into a you know, a shop, so to speak. But these are, you know, three of these images are, are real and you can see them. Um, they're, I mean, they're all real, but you can, you could go and visit the Autodesk space, but that is not, that is not an aspiration. That is what we, we intend to do. Yeah, Alice, I think if, um, if anybody would ever like to get a, a tour of the shipyard and see the current facilities, Jeff, I'm not sure if you have those images, but these are, you know, containers and huts and shacks and people are welding outside in January and February and it's it's just not conducive to an efficient operation or to entice new workers you know um, nobody wants to work in those conditions so our goal is to take this ground floor of these development buildings and build out state-of-the-art welding fabrication shops training facilities I mean these are this is on your right hand side there that's the current electrical substation the panel that's been there since 1940s. So we're currently committing to a million dollar upgrade of that right now. And so all of these facilities have to be totally upgraded. And that, and that really is the goal is that the upper floor supporting uses of life science. We're fortunate that life science is a, a boom right now. Hopefully we can take advantage of that to create very reasonably priced or cheap, basically free space on the ground floor for Boston Ship Repair to upgrade its facilities. Yeah, I think you guys are designing exactly what the new Ray Flynn Marine 
master plan suggested that you can balance those two things. Um, I've got some questions in the chat, but Aaron's got his hand up. So I'm going to go to Aaron next and then go back to chat questions. Thanks, Alice. And, and thanks to the um, development team for this presentation. Uh, the more I hear about this project, the more I like it. Um, I want to ask um, on the topic of resiliency, whether uh, you all, and, and John, I'd like to take you up on that tour of the, the shipyard at some point when the weather gets a little nicer. Right. Um, uh, are, are you all going to be participating in the Climate Resiliency Infrastructure Fund that the city is is uh, setting up right now? Yeah, absolutely. That's part of our lease agreement with the city. We're going through finalizing lease negotiations right now, but that's a commitment that we, we put in the lease already. Great. Thank you. Ed. Yeah, Alice, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm very excited. I, I can't talk enough about the shipyard and uh, and I'd be glad to, you know, to show it to anybody and, and really show the infrastructure and everything else. I, I've been here since the inception. You know, when we came back here in the early 90s to open up really a dead shipyard, you know, I, I've seen everything go go tenfold here. Uh, the things that, you know, John and his team, but, you know, teaming with us now in the shipyard, it, it's just amazing. You know, when we first came here, we probably had about 200 direct union workers uh, in our facility. We're currently down to probably around down 80. And about out of that 80, probably half of them are over 60. Uh, we subcontract out quite a bit. Uh, this project is gonna generate so much for the shipyard in terms of development, uh, you know, the economic standpoint, getting apprentice programs set up. We need the younger generation to get into this. The younger generation in this area in the Northeast, it's a dying breed. All the work is down South. And if we don't step up now to be able to rebuild the shipyard with youth infrastructure, it's going to go away. I can guarantee you. I know this business as well as anybody in this business throughout the country. I've been doing this for close to 40 years. And this is going to revitalize everything, but it does need the additives of what John and his team are trying to bring in here with the building to subsidize the cost of the shipyard. Yes, it's an expensive business. But to, to really keep the area growing and to revitalize the shipyard and just to save the shipyard, these are necessities. You know, I, I come from the standpoint that I am the shipyard. You know, I've seen what goes on there. John mentioned, you know, what we deal with with weather, you know, uh, other facilities. And, and I know all the facilities throughout the country. And I know by far people are amazed that we were able to maintain the yard up here as long as we have. And... I am so excited to be part of this team going forward uh, to, to see the rebuild of this, to, to see this grow from where it was a long time ago to, to what it can become in a few few years down the line. It's just amazing. And I would love to talk to anybody that's interested, give tours to anybody that's interested. Uh, it's an amazing business. And the thing that you mentioned earlier, you know, it's funny, you drew the, the viewing platform up. I was thinking the same thing as you were drawing it because that is the best view of the shipyard. While it's not part of our infrastructure and, and belong to the city, if that could be elevated for a viewing platform, you get the full view of the dry dock going right down on the ship. It's the best view you could have that people could see. Uh, and, uh, but there's, there's so much, and I'm excited about the opportunity to work with John and his team. And, and I think it's a fabulous thing and, and really looking forward to a few years, uh, just looking back and says, it's amazing. You know, we, 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 made full circle here and i'm just excited to, to talk about it and to show people about it yeah uh, and just what just one side note just so you know at, at rbtv one of our goals is to go from 500 to 1,000 kids our final program that we're going to be launching soon is our career journey program and that is introducing our kids to the trades and all the different opportunities so we would definitely uh i'd love to connect with you on that and, and having being in that location would be huge in just exposing our kids to that I appreciate it. They're great opportunities and they're really great paying jobs for these, for these kids today. Thank you. Yeah, I want to just put in a plug. Um, Jill Horwood is here. She's now with the Bar Foundation, but she was previously with Boston Harbor now. And I'm going to put in the chat a link to a report she did a few years ago talking about how to bring the working port into the 21st century. And I think this partnership is really modeling the kind of creative strategies that she was highlighting. So kudos to that. 
Um, Mary Fisk from the South Boston Neighborhood House chimes into the chat that she thinks this is another inclusive and visionary project from the Cronin Group, but didn't want to take up too much time. So I'm just reading that out. So you've got it. Um, and then there's a question, double question from Frank Zanti. He says that there's a lot of trucking that goes through this area to Black Falcon, um, to FID Kennedy. How is it being addressed both towards the safety of pedestrians and to not interrupt the routes to and from businesses? So how do you think that's working? Maybe it's a city project, um, as well as um, Sarah adds, what about cyclists in that mix? Alliance, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, so we started off our uh, traffic study by reading the, the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Industrial Park Master Plan, which uh, has, lays a very su substantial emphasis on the need to ensure that truck traffic is uh, facilitated through the park as that is the lifeblood of the park. It is still an industrial park. Uh, however, we're very conscious of the fact that we need to accommodate uh, and especially accommodate pedestrians and bike bicyclists as well. So we've worked really hard to ensure that we're not impeding truck traffic and at the same time imp improving pedestrian and bicycle facilities by where possible having separate facilities for both and dramatically improving crosswalks uh, where we can and within uh, the limits of the of the project area. There is a very substantial Northern Avenue uh, bicycle and ped project forthcoming that will make some dramatic improvements in that corridor. Uh, we know the need to keep FID Kennedy um, wide open to trucks uh, and, and our scope doesn't really extend that far up anyway. Um, so we're, but we're aware that uh, in the future that needs to be addressed in terms of pedestrian and bicycle access. So our focus has been on this drawing, as you see here, on the Tide Street Northern Ave and Tide Street Dry Dock intersections, and then along Dry Dock Avenue to ensure that bicyclists and pedestrians are accommodated to the maximum extent possible and that we're not impairing any truck access and that all the roads will be designed to accommodate uh, the, the, the kind of trucks that are circulating in this neighborhood. And further that our, our own docks are accessible to the size trucks that we expect there. Great. Um, on a similar pedestrian note, I know that this is an area where there's not a harbor walk expectation, right? The, the actual waterfront is, is the most working of working port areas that we have on the waterfront with the dry dock. But I didn't know if you guys are thinking at all, and this might actually be a Katya or Jeff question about how the pedestrian experience on the corner of Tide and Dry Dock, if there's anything that makes it feel like you're on the Harbor Walk or similar to the Harbor Walk or that, hey, you can keep going this way and find some more Harbor Walk, if you put any thought into that. Um, I, I, we, I mean, I, I don't think we have as a, as, a, as a team analyst, but we could certainly facilitate um, wayfinding that would suggest that. I mean, we all know that um, you know, that just a continuation down dry dock gets you to the corner of dry dock at the end of 27, where all of a sudden you're, you, you see a big blue painted walkway that takes you all the way over to the east um, apron, the southeast apron of um, 88 Black Falcon. Um, that's a project that I'm involved with. So I'm familiar with the, con you know, the idea of making the connectivity of the harbor walk. So I do, th I do think that you, since you can't really, you know, there's whole sections of this that are disconnected, this might be the better way or might be the only way that you can currently get down there. So it might make some sense in this area here in this west to have some wayfinding that would be integrated into the landscaping that would suggest you could continue down dry dock and get to the harbor. Yeah. Great. Um, as we are approaching the 10 o'clock hour, I will say, ooh, we've got one more chat. Um, Mary would love to talk later with Ricardo and the team about Nubian shuttle stopping and providing access to other places in South Boston. Maybe that's a spinoff or maybe that's part of the route. Um, just want to note Mary and Ricardo can connect. They want they want to chat. Um, as we approach 10 o'clock, I want to thank everyone from this phenomenal team. Um, I'm really appreciative that so many of you joined us this morning and I'm appreciative of so many people who are not part of the team who joined us and asked some great questions and who are here to learn more this morning. 
Um, most of you know, because you found out about this somehow, Boston Harbor now holds monthly or nearly monthly Harbor Use Forums. Um, we'd love to see you at them. They're always, almost always the fourth Wednesday of the month in first thing in the morning at 830. You can follow all of Boston Harbor Now's work on social media. We have regular emails. You can sign up at bostonharbornow.org. Um, we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We hope that over the coming weeks, you get out on the water and enjoy it. You go check out this phenomenal site. Um, and oops. Uh, Sarah McCammon has one last question. <laughs> she wants to know, she says there are three life sciences projects happening in the Marine Park. Um, she's curious about how this one might be different. So Sarah, I can connect you with the team to make sure that you have an answer there. Um, with that, I want to thank all of you again. Stay well, wear your mask, get your shots, and we'll hope to see you all on the waterfront soon. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye-bye.